job. We're going to talk about work. We're going to talk about business. And I really believe that your job and your business is a place where you can manifest the love of God to the world. It is God's call for you to reveal who God is in your life, your job and your work. It has to be fun. Everybody say that, fun. fun. It's got to be fun and we're going to talk about that today. Are you ready? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light. Matthew chapter 25 verse 29. Let's read together. For to every person who has something, even more will be given and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. This is a very difficult passage but it simply means one thing. That if you use your gift, you will receive so much more. And if you will not use your gift, even the gift that you have will be taken away. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, it says together, Do not neglect your gift. Tell someone beside you, do not neglect your gift. Amen. And in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 20 to 29, it says together, Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. Place both hands over your chest and say this after me. I will serve the king of all kings. I'm going to share with you four principles on how to be successful in your job, in your work, and in your business. How many of you want to be successful in that area of your life? You want that? Amen? Everybody say, I want to be successful. I mean, we want to be successful in all areas of our life, in our spiritual life, in our family life, in our relationships. But we also want to be happy and joyful and successful in our jobs, in our work, and in our business. I'd like to share with you four principles. How many? Four, four principles. And the first one is you've got to learn to play. Everybody say that with me, learn to play learn to play. I, I was talking to, to someone recently and, and he was saying, Brother Bo, did you just come from the U.S.? And I said, I, I kind of like groped. I said, you came from the U.S., right? And I said, did I come from the U.S.? Well, yeah, but I think I came from Singapore already. So I came from the U.S., landed here in Manila, went to Singapore, you know, after one day, then preached in the, in the feast. It was really all, all hazy to me. And he told me something. It was, it was, it was really very curious. He said, very, he said, Brother Bo, you shouldn't be working too hard. And I laughed and I said, that's my problem. I'm not working. I really am not. I'm playing. I'm having so much fun. And sisters and brothers, this is the scenario of every person who is successful in what he's doing, in his job, in his business, and in his work. He's playing. And I'm going to challenge you, you've got to learn to play. You know how I prepared for this teaching series? This, this teaching series has nine talks, right? Choose to be wealthy. You know how I did it? I went to Tagaytay, holed up in a hotel, and stayed there for five days. And I brought a little knapsack for my clothes, a whole luggage full of books. I read 18 books in five days. I would wake up at six in the morning, and I would, I would read and study and write all the way until 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock near midnight. How many hours was that? 16 to 17 hours every day. Now, if I describe that to you, what will you say? Oh, poor Bo. Oh, no, so much work. Man, I was in heaven. I really was in heaven during those five days. I love what I do. I love it so much. I'm having fun. I'm playing. And I'm going to invite you. Are you playing in your business? Are you having fun? Are you loving every minute of what you're doing? The reason why I'm successful is because I'm not working. I'm having fun. And I'm asking you, and I'm asking you this question, are you having fun? Am I making sense here? There's this quote, and it's, uh, it's from Richard Carlson. And he says this, When you love what you do, it's difficult not to succeed. 
Amen? Say that with me again. When you love what you do, it's difficult not to succeed. Can you ask the person beside you? Touch that person. Ask that person, do you love what you do? So principle number one is learn to play. Everybody say that with me. Learn to play. If you're not having fun, then maybe you're in the wrong game. Then maybe you're playing the wrong game because you're not having fun. Because here's principle number two. You've got to stick to your game. Everybody say that. Stick to your game. What do I mean? You know, I'm, I'm a... I'm a preacher and I'm a writer. That's the gift that God has given to me. And, but you know, sometimes in my work, I've, I, I had to do some administration work and I had to do some counseling work. You know, when you preach to a lot of people, a lot, sometimes people would come up to me and say, Brother Bo, I've got a problem and, and can you counsel me? And so, sure, I try. But you know, it's not my gift. And for years, I mean, I've been in ministry for what, 30 years? Um, almost 30 years and and so you know I, I would in the past they would come to me and say brother Bo can I see you in the office I have got a I've got a major problem I want some advice and I would say sure and so I would talk to this person this person would come to the office and sit down and so he, he would share his problem and I would be here and and I would I would say okay uh, yeah uh-huh uh-huh hmm right that's the problem that's good okay here's the solution number one number two and number three there bye-bye God bless you have fun you know and then I, I thought everything would be fine but two weeks later this person would come back and say you see brother Bo there's another angle to my problem oh really okay sit down you know I, I, I was losing patience and, and then I realized one thing through the years that I was not a good counselor I really really was not I would I would teach when, when, you know, in counseling, you don't teach. In counseling, you listen. You, whoa, really? Oh. And then what happened? And you let the person discover the solution. I don't have the patience. I, I want to say, this is the solution. One, two, three. You know, brothers and sisters, I realize one thing. You've got to stick to your game. If you want to be successful, you don't do something that you're not good at. You focus on what you're good at and you, and you focus your whole life there. There's this, there's this person I'm sure you know. His name is Michael Jordan. You know the guy? No, you don't? Michael Jordan, he is one of the, one of the greatest basketball... I think he is the... Many, 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 many believe he is the greatest basketball player who has ever lived in the history of basketball. He is incredible. And, and the way he would dunk the ball. He was the one who invented the, the different kinds of dunks. He's, he's the man who, who won the NB, N, NBA title six times. He is the one who, who uh, was given the, I think, nine times the defensive award team. And, and, and he, he played 14 times in the NBA All-Star Games. That's Michael Jordan, a great athlete. Now, now think with me. In 1993, something happened. In 1993, he resigned. He retired. I don't know if you remember that. But in 1993, he retired. And what happened was after a few months, he signed up for minor league baseball. Now, in minor league baseball, he was no good. No one invited him to the major league. Now, here's, here's, here's a thought. Are you ready? The same body, the same athlete, the same legs, the same arms, the same brain, the same anatomy is incredible in basketball, is average in baseball. Did you get me? I'll show you a, baseball, a, 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 a basketball card of Michael Jordan. A, a, a basketball card of Mark, Michael Jordan would cost as much as $650 per card, per card, $650, okay? N not, all, not all basketball cards, some, okay? A baseball card of Michael Jordan would cost about $1. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna say it again. Same body, same person, same legs, same arms would have different results in one game and another game. You see, the temptation for many people is if you are successful in one area, 
you get tempted and say, I'll probably be also be very good in another area. You got me? Hey, I'm good in preaching. I'm good in the Word of God. I'm good in writing. Hey, I must be good in counseling also. Is that true? No. Hey, I'm good in preaching. I'm good in writing. You know what? I'll probably be very good in, in administration. What do you think? No. Hey, I'm good in preaching. I'm good in writing. I must be very good in dancing. No. I'm good in preaching. I'm good in writing. I must be very good in, 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 in singing or in, da- or, in, or in fixing things. Or in, you know, no. Everybody say that with me. No. Everybody say, stick to your game. Tell someone beside you, stick to your game. You've got to stay where, you're, where your gifting is. God has given you a particular gift. Don't be tempted to go elsewhere. Stick to your game. I have a, I have a lovely, lovely quote here. And it's from, it's from Andrew uh, Carnegie. And he says, Put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. Isn't that great? You know, they're, they're, people are saying, no, you, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, well our, Andrew Carnegie would say, why not put all your eggs in one basket and really focus and watch that one basket? Principle number three, and I know you're going to be shocked by this, but why not forget your weaknesses? Why, 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 why develop your weakness? You know, I'm terrible in administration. I, I simply am not good in the details. And so somebody can come up to me and say, Brother Bo, you know what? You're not good in administration. Take a course on administration. You know, study. Read books on administration so that you could develop being an administrator. And, and uh, because, you know, you're, you, you have organizations under you and so that. And, and my answer would be, you know what? Why spend time and energy and attention on, on developing a weakness why don't I spend the same time, the same energy, the same attention in developing my strength? Forget your weakness. Focus on what you're good at. In school, we were trained to be a well-balanced person. Am I right? You know, you could be good in English. You could be good in, in, in a religion. You could be good in science, but you could be terrible in math. And so what, what school will do is say, hey, you're, you're, you're already good in English, you're already good in science, we want you to focus on your math because your grades are bad. That's what school does. And, and, that, and that's part of school, that's part of training, and that's okay. But you see, you don't bring the same philosophy when you graduate and when you enter life and when you go to work and when you go to business. You can't do that because in life, You are rewarded not because you're a good all-around average guy, good in all things. You are rewarded in life for being very good in one thing. Understand me? Life will reward you when you become an expert in one thing. Now what is that one thing? What is that one thing? In school, my grades were, were pretty okay in religion, even during that time when I was growing up. And it was, it was okay for English. I was terrible in math. Really terrible. I had a grade 2, I was already failing. I, I had a 72 in, in, in math. And I, I shared this already with you, that, that my mother had to get a tutor for me, for, for math. And after one year, thanks be to God, my grades went up. It, it, it became 75. And, and that was because my tutor was my math teacher. But you know what? The, the thing that, that struck me was today, I don't do math. I really don't. I'm, I was really born to preach. I was born to write. And when you have a weakness, and for me it was math, it is not God's invitation to develop it. When you have a weakness, it is God's invitation for you to work with others whose strength is your weakness. And I have wonderful people whose expertise is math, who live, drink, walk, and talk accounting, for example. They, they love accounting. They, they do nothing else but accounting. When they read a novel, they look at the page numbers. 
because that's all done. I mean, they, 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 they love accounting, that's their gift. They, they don't like words, they like numbers. You know what I mean? And I work with them. And so I'm going to say it again. When you have a weakness, it's not God's invitation for you to develop it. It's God's invitation for you to work with others whose strength is your weakness. You know what? Sometimes you have to sacrifice. In this principle, you've got to sacrifice. I, I, love, I, love, uh, I love composing songs. And I've composed about 50 songs already, 50 plus in my lifetime. Started when I was age 13. And I told you my, about my first song. I, I love sharing it. You know, my very first compo composition. The title is I Love You. It's, it's Jesus singing to us. I love you. You know? Ah, yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. It's a refrain, sing, uh, I love you, sing 16 times. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first worship song. And, but, but I, you know, the other songs were pretty good. They're, they're um, strong and faithful. Sometimes we sing that. For though a thousand may fall and mountains may crumble and uh, build your throne in our assembly. So those are the more popular ones. But you know what? There became a point in my life a few years back when I decided, look, I like composing songs. I really do. Worship songs. But life is short. I, I, I just had this realization. Life is short. I have very little time. I could spend three, four hours composing one song. Sometimes more. Or I could use that same three, four hours developing a talk or writing a book. And I began to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, as a composer, I'm okay. I'm not great. My, my worship songs are not great. They're, they're circa 75. They're, they, they sound Voltus 5. They, they really do. I mean, I'm, I'm not hiding that from you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy with old music taste. So, so my worship songs are okay, but they're not great. But when I write a book, I'm fantastic. <clears throat> And I made a decision some years back. I'm going to focus on my strength. I'm not going to develop. I, I can. I can, go, I can go to the composers. I can, I can say, can you teach me how to compose songs? How to, I, I can. I can devote some time there. But, but I decided I'm going to stick to my game. Amen? You, you've gotta, sometimes you've got to be ruthless. And you've got to search your heart. And you've got to ask yourself that question. What is God calling me? Where is God calling me? What is He telling me to do? And focus your entire life. There. Every single time and every, every, every ebb of energy you've got and attention, focus there and succeed. Principle number four. Reinvent yourself. But what you do is, do not reinvent yourself outside your game. That's the temptation. Reinvent yourself within your game. I was... The, the example I have would be Stallone. Sylvester Stallone. He, he, you know, I told you the story in, in one of my talks that when he came out with Rocky, Rocky won. It became a, a uh, best picture and best actor Award, awarded movie and uh, you know box office great 171 million dollars and and then he followed with Rocky 2 and uh, Rocky 3 I remember Rocky Rocky I think that was Rocky 3 when he fought a a huge Russian monster uh, every time Stallone would, would hit him it, it, it was as though he would be hitting steel you know just, and but but at the end of the movie, of course, obviously, Rocky won. I remember watching that movie as a kid. And, and <laughs> the movie house was, in, you know, was really fun because you know, when, when at the end of the movie, when, when Rocky Balboa won, the whole movie, movie house, all the people there stood up you know, and, and they, they cheered as though it was a live match. I mean, he, the, the movies were fantastic. 
And so I thought, my gosh, he would be so good that there'll, there'll probably be a Rocky 63 when Stallone will be 75 years old, you know, fighting an alien. I mean, he, but you know, what, what, what Sylvester Stallone did was he reinvented himself and he came out with Rambo. Rambo was a emotionally disturbed U.S. Marine and, and uh, he, he was sent back to Vietnam and, and, it was, it, and so it was, it was also such a, a killer in the box office that he came out with Rocky II and, and Rocky III. I'm sorry, sorry, Rambo, Rambo II and Rambo III. And, and then he did something that many successful people do at a certain point in their life. And, and you know, you, you rea- you'd, you'd ask yourself, why would a successful person do this? But, but he did it. He went out of his game and he produced a comedy. And he produced two comedies and both of them bombed. Everyone was, were, they, they, he, was, he was mercilessly killed in the, in the, in the, the critics were, were saying, you know, why in the world did, did Sylvester do that? And so the movies did not earn any money. He lost a lot of money. And so he went back to action. Tell someone beside you, don't go too far your success. Say that. What you do is you stay within your area of success and you keep on reinventing yourself. You keep on changing yourself, but within the game, not outside the game, within the game. About 10 years ago, I reinvented myself in one sense. Because for the longest time, I was a preacher preaching about spiritual matters. I would preach about prayer and I would preach about the Bible and I would preach about salvation. And so I would speak to prayer groups and only to prayer groups. Some years ago, when I got married, I began to speak about family life. And then when I entered into business, I started speaking about the finances. So it was a reinvention. But the reinvention was that so, so that I could speak. And so now I don't only speak to prayer groups. I speak to businesses. I speak to companies. I speak to a group of employees. I speak to executives. I speak to all sorts of people. And they're not, they're, they, they don't even have to be religious thoughts. But somewhere, somehow, they receive the Word of God. So that was what you call a reinvention. And my ministry has, has grown in impact because of that. And so say that with me again. Reinvent. Find a way of how you can impact more lives using the same gift. For me, it was preaching and writing. What is your gift? Reinvent yourself so that you can impact more people. Let me just share with you the different kinds of businesses. Just to open your eyes, I'd like to just very quickly go through this. You know, why don't you think of a franchise or direct selling or the internet as a start of getting into business? Just as a start, just a, I'm just giving you some ideas. I mean, sure, you can go to traditional business and that's fine. But here are some ways of just entering into it, if, you, if you're entering it into, the, into business for the first time. The principles of starting a business. Number one, find something you're passionate about. Number two, get first-hand experience in the business. When you get into a business, find a way, maybe, maybe work for a business that you, let's say you want to put up a laundry shop then why, why, don't you, why don't you work for one? Or you want to get into a, you want to start a little restaurant, then why not work for one first before you actually start one yourself? Number three, start small. Never start big. Always start small because you're going to fail. And so you've got to fail quickly so that you can start again. And so start small. Number four, dream big. When you start something, be sure that you can scale it up. Be sure that you can expand it. Number five, have mentors. Always, always have mentors when you start a business. Never go into something if you don't have someone who's been doing what you want to do for the past 20 years. Number six, learn a new skill. How to run a business. You know, you come to me and say, Bo, I'm a great cook. I'm a wonderful cook, I'm going to start a restaurant. Sure, that's fine, but you need another skill, it's running a business. So yeah, you can be a good cook and you can start a restaurant, but, but running a restaurant is different from cooking and staying in the kitchen. 
So you've got to learn that new skill. And that's why I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail. You're going to fail in the first few months, in the first few years. But that's okay. Start small and dream big. Number seven, be a marketing expert. Learn about marketing. When you're going to get into business, you've got to, you've got to sell. You've got to learn to sell. And you've got to find, find out how to do that. Number eight, focus on your strength. And number nine, hire people better than yourself. Hire people better than yourself. I'm going to share with you these two trophies that we received from the Catholic Mass Media Award just last week. This is for Mustard, Mustard magazine that we produce. We, we were awarded the best kids magazine by the Catholic Mass Media Award. Fish magazine was awarded the best teens magazine also by the Catholic Mass Media Award. And you know what I love about this? This could not have happened if people were not having fun and if people did not have passion. 500 entrepreneurs were interviewed and they were, they, they were surveyed and they were studied and they were researched on. And they were asking this question, what was common among the 500 entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs? And they found out that, that there was no one entrepreneur type. There was none. Some were good in numbers. Some were good in sales. Some were good in operations. You know, they, they, they were different. Different kinds of people, different kinds. But you know what? They found out one thing. Every single entrepreneur had passion. Passion for what they were doing. The people who won these trophies for us, Riza, George, Joy, the whole production department, the people who work in all our ministries, it's passion. We, we, we pay them you know, standard salaries, the, the usual benefits that the government asks us to, but nothing more. We, we don't give them fat bonus checks. We don't give them a gym in the office. They don't have a sleek canteen. They don't even have a canteen. They're nothing. The only thing we give them is a playground to play in. They're there because they love to be there. Our turnover is so low, my gosh. We're, we're, I'm, I'm going to see people who will live there and stay there until they're 65. They're, they're, they, they, they love being in the ministry. They love being in the company. And it's because of passion. They know that when they're there, they're fulfilling their mission and they're serving God and they're blessing the world. Now you can do the same thing in your job. You can do the same thing in your business. If you believe that you're serving God and blessing the world. This is my son's magnifying glass. Borrowed it for a while. This is, this magnifying glass can be powerful or powerless. The magnifying glass can be powerful or it could be powerless. And it's determined by two things only. Number one, if it will utilize the power of the sun. You see, if this is not under the sun, it will not be powerful, it will be powerless. Amen? It's, it's got to be under the sunlight, only then will it become powerful. But here's the second thing. Are you ready? Are you ready? Even if it's under the sunlight and there's a, there's, there's a whole, whole stack of, of dried up hay in front of it, okay? If it keeps on moving, if it keeps on moving, it won't do anything. Amen? It's got to stay in one thing and focus on one thing. And the sun will take care of it. It will burn. You got me? Number one, you've got to stay under the sun. You and me, we're nothing. But God is there. The reason why, the reason why, the reason why I can preach and the reason why I can write is because I'm under the sunlight. The kingdom of God is within you, says Jesus. God's power is within me. God's power is within you. And it flows through us. And that's the reason why we're powerful. But listen to me. If I keep on moving around, nothing will happen as well. I've got to focus. 
I've got to focus the power of God in one spot and I can impact the world. Now what's your spot? What's your spot? Choose that. Devote your whole life on that one spot. Let the power of God, the sunlight, flow through you and impact the world. Have fun. Start playing. Live a great and wonderful life.